let's recap challenge one real quick. Write a program that asks the user for two number and then print the sum. This is a simple problem that could have been handled with three lines of code, right? On the surface, it does look simple. But if we tried to write the code before tests, then we would have ran into issues very quickly. We would have started with the input functions first and then immediately ran into problems as we tried to add numbers together. Why? Because the input function doesn't return numbers. It returns a string. You just assumed it returned numbers. We wouldn't write functions either. We'd work on converting strings to numbers and then making sure we could add them, but we'd also be running the code over and over again to check the output manually. Instead, we went with the test-driven approach, where we are first understanding the feature and writing down scenarios against it so all of us are on the same page. We then wrote tests for the behaviors we wanted, which made writing the functions really easy. We are also confident our functions work because we have tests against them. This is the power of test-driven development, or TDD. But we are missing something really important. Right now, the tests we've written are positive tests, meaning that we are passing in valid inputs with clear outputs. This is great to validate that our functions work. However, we haven't tried negative tests yet. Negative tests use invalid inputs with unclear outputs. We use these types of questions and theories to identify risk in the application so we can solve it or at least handle it, making for a more robust application. Using the same feature, take a look at the following negative scenario. Adding a string to a number should return what? Let's use Gherkin to describe an example. Given x equals Carlos and y equals 2, when I add them together, then what should the function return? Testing against unknowns is called exploring. Using the test case formula, we currently have inputs, but we're not really sure what the output is yet. However, we do have some ideas. What does your oracle say? For example, there are a couple outputs that would suggest our function is doing something unexpected or buggy. Like, the function returns Carlos Carlos. That would be kind of weird, but it's a possibility. The program could break or explode, which would straight up just be a bug. But there's also different things too. More outputs that would make sense, like Carlos too. Let's write a test using our current theory. Here we are back in code, and you can see lines 4, 5, and 6 are my new test. I called it test string input because I don't exactly know what I'm asserting yet, and so I gave it a generic name. On line five, my variable is just called output because again, I'm exploring right now. I don't really know what my output is supposed to be. Our idea, our theory, is that if I were to add Carlos and T together, I would get Carlos two in string form. So let's run the test and see what we get back. Oh, test failed and all of the red text happened. Let's scroll down here to find out what we did wrong. All right, it's showing me that it failed on this line, output equals add Carlos2. And if I scroll down a bit further, here's the error message. When I tried to use my return x plus y, x in this case is Carlos and y was two, I got a type error can only concatenate string, not integer, to string. The error is telling us that our add function can't add a string of Carlos with an integer of two using that plus operator. In other words, our add function is not handling strings very well. We will solve this by using if-else logic, 
So if x or y are strings, we'll return an error message instead of breaking the application. But before we do that, you've only seen if else at a surface level, I think it's time for us to dive deeper into it. If statements kind of work like assert statements, where you put Boolean expressions on the right. The biggest difference is that the if statement is followed by a code block that is executed if the statement is true. A Boolean expression is a statement that returns true or false. Here are some examples of if statements and blocks. If coding is fun, print it sure is. If 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, print math is heard. Else is used when the if statement is false. If you like this course, print you get extra credit. Else print you done failed the class. Elif gives you extra control if there are more than just two decisions and works like an if statement. It will go through each elif branch until it finds one that is true. If none of them are true, then the else block at the end is executed. If the weather is sunny, I wear shades and I wear shorts. If weather is windy, I'll wear a sweater. Elif the weather is snowy, I wear a coat and I'll snowboard. If it's none of these things, I'm confused. I'll wear sweaters and I'll wear shorts. Using our new powers of if and else, let's update our add function to handle string inputs. I'm using the built-in isInstance function from Python to check that x is a string or that y is a string. Let's read this as if it were in plain English. If x is a string or y is a string, return error. Else, return x plus y. Let's switch back over to our tests and let's run all of them to see what they tell us. Immediately we see that two tests failed and four passed. If we look through our error message, we can see what happened. It looks like the first test that failed is expected. This one right here. We no longer expect this to be Carlos2 because we just changed our function. If we put in a string, then instead of returning another string, we just return error. So let's update our tests to return what we now expect. Error, invalid numbers entered. Perfect. The second test that failed, we keep scrolling down here, is this one. Test adding negative numbers returns a negative number. Let's go down here. Sure enough, it says assert is even, is false, is failing for us. And that makes sense, because negative two is an even number. And yet, for some reason, we were checking that it was false. I hope you caught that and didn't just believe me when I wrote this function. What good are tests if we don't actually execute them, right? This is a simple fix. I'll just delete this line. And if you did the extra credit challenge for this test here to check if a number was positive, you can probably use that same function to take care of this test too. Now that we've updated our tests, we can click this play button again on the left hand side to rerun all the tests. And awesome, all six of our tests passed. The last thing that we need to do is to create a function that will convert strings into numbers. That way we can add them properly. So let's go back up to the top of our test file. And as always, again, we always start with our tests. Let's have our variable, call it number, is equal to convert to number, and let's put in a string of five, let's say, as our example. We'll then assert that once we've done the conversion, 
number is now equal to 5. Just like before, convert to number is red because it doesn't exist. So let's switch back to our add numbers function and let's add it here. I'll put it above our add function just because we need to convert numbers first before we put it into the add function. The order that the functions are in doesn't actually matter, but it's how I organize my code so then there's this very linear and logical flow as I'm reading from top to bottom. For the name of this parameter, I'm just going to call it string because we want to turn that string into a number. Then we'll return the integer version of the string. Let's go back to our tests. Let's make sure we bring this in and then run the test. Looks like things are working there. But as you may have noticed, that was only a positive test. If you'd like to, feel free to write negative tests against it and continue optimizing this code. Let's finish challenge one though, so then I can give you challenge two as an assignment. Going back to add numbers, we'll finally create our challenge one function here at the bottom of the file. Def challenge one. The first input is going to be the first number, right? So enter a number. The second number, input, enter another number. We'll then convert them. So num1 is equal to convert to number input 1. And then same thing for number 2. And now that we know they're valid numbers, we can now get a total by adding them both together. Num1 and add with num2. Print that out and our function is complete. Now to execute this file without messing with our test file, we're going to add a main statement. We'll enter a couple times and type in main. That's actually a code snippet that if we press enter will get added automatically. For now, don't worry too much about what that is doing. Just call the function we want to run, in this case challenge1. Now we can click this green button to run this file. Enter a number, I'll do three, another number, four. And we got seven. So far it looks like everything's working, but I'm sure you're already thinking of ways you can poke holes in our current implementation. Depending on what you enter, you might not get what you expect either. I wonder how far you can take this challenge to make it as bug-free as possible. But with that, we're all done with challenge one. All right, are you ready for challenge two? Under chapter two, create a seasons.py file and write a program that does the following, with scenarios and tests, of course. Ask the user to enter a season. Using this input, create the logic to handle different seasons. If the input is winter, print snow. If the input is spring, print flowers. If the input is summer, print beach. If the input is fall or autumn, print leaves. If it's anything else, print I don't know that season. Once that's all complete, make sure to push this all up to the cloud. Back in Gitkraken, we're going to do things a little bit differently this time just because we're dealing with the branch now. Pushing our code up to the cloud is the same as before. We're going to stage the changes that we care about, add a summary, I'll just call mine challenge2, commit those changes, and then push. For this part, we just want to click submit. Origin is the cloud, and chapter 2 is our branch. Submit. What makes this different is that chapter 2 is different from master branch. 
you can actually see that chapter 2 is above the master branch because it includes everything from master as well as our newest changes from chapter 2. This is useful because we want to make sure that everything in our branch works correctly before merging it into our master branch, which is our production branch. Since we added tests, we know that everything in chapter 2 is good to go. However, we still want to do a code review. Code reviews is when you can have one or more other people check out your code just to make sure that it looks good to them as well. Just like our tests, code reviews can provide valuable insights and feedback, especially if you're doing it with someone who is more senior than you are. To create the pull request in Gitkraken, we simply right click on chapter 2 and do this start pull request to origin from chapter 2. Starting at the top, we're using GitHub, so that's good. The repo is the exact same repo. Our branch is from chapter 2, we're trying to merge it to master. The title is challenge 2, we can give it any description we'd like and even add other people or tag them in case we want to organize or notify people to do the pull request and code review. Once this is good to go, we'll click create pull request and then view on github.com. It takes us right to GitHub and shows us the actual pull request. You can then share this with others to see what you've done, even look at the files that were changed. They can start their review, add comments, post questions, anything needed in order to make sure that what this pull request was meant to do achieves that and is of high quality. Once this is reviewed by your mentor or instructor and they pass it off, all that's left to do is complete the merge. One more confirmation, and everything you had in Chapter 2 now exists in the master branch. You can even see here, the pull request was successful, and it's safe to delete if you want to. Going back to Gitkraken, you can actually see that things changed. Notice how there's this branch that's stemming out from the main trunk. Also notice how master on the cloud is now above chapter 2. At this point, you can double click on master to check it out, and then we're going to reset our local, which is way behind, and bring our local back up to match what's inside of the cloud. So reset local to here. And there you have it. You're now doing modern software development. You're creating branches, so that way you're protecting the master branch, as well as making your changes. We're adding tests as we code and designing and using our critical thinking skills and questions and theories to drive how we code. And you're doing code reviews, which is something that you'll get very, very used to as you continue in your journey of software engineering. So keep on keeping on because you look like a real software developer. I'll see you in the next chapter.